shirt or sweats or shoes that you really should get rid of, but man, they're totally comfortable. The ones you go home and like you put on and you're like, I'm home, yeah, I'm not going anywhere. Why do you keep that shit? Part of it, memories, right? Right. Is that kind of, even if it's not something that you got significantly, it's this thing you've had that you like worn into it, all of that. Anybody have a mom, aunt, grandma, dad, uncle who cooks something like that's like that's you're like, oh, so and so's cooking that? Anybody got that? Like in that as in good that, not as in, oh, they're cooking that. Okay. Anybody got that? Okay, so you see that pot, that pan, imagine it on the stove, in the oven, wherever. Is it all new and, and they have that, that's what it's usually cooked in. You see that? You know, that? Is it all new and shiny and fancy? <laughs> you can see that, right? You said not new and shiny. Uh, a little beat up, sometimes bent. Anybody got that, that bean pot or the chili pot or whatever it is, right? The spaghetti sauce pot, whatever that thing is. Oh, a little beat up. Anybody else see that? Take it to the Goodwill, they'd be like, ah, I'll get this nicer one over here. Does it mean more to you than just a pot or a pan? Okay, so here's what I got. I got this wooden box. It was my mom. She got it for graduation, so that's kind of cool, too, in itself. There's a whole other story there. But inside that box, I have some really freaky things. I have teeth. They're little baby teeth from when my son lost some of his teeth. Do you know there's some, do you have teeth? Yeah, I know. It's like, and you know, like if somebody didn't understand that kind of cultural thing, can you imagine people coming, like they have teeth. What's this thing with women and teeth in boxes, right? They'd be like, well, this is weird. Right? Yeah, so that canister and you could do teeth, right? I have one of my son's old pacifiers, you know. And the, the rubber part, it's so old that it's like, you know, when rubber gets old and like sticky and gummy. And when I looked at it last time, I'm like, I should really, I'm like, I should throw that away. And I just dropped it back in there. I have from even before that, pre-kid, I have an empty marble cigarette box, you know, the, in the box, flattened out. Somebody left at my house once, like it was like, you know, party central for a while. I got all that done early, so I don't have to worry about it now. Um, why? I don't know. There's just something that takes me back to that time in my life. I have this purse that was my mom's. It's not in that box. This purse. Oh, my God. And I'm like, you can tell. I am not fashion guru, right? I mean, it is what it is. All my jewelry may be bling, but it's cheap. Okay. Um, so my mom had this purse, and I have it now, and it's, Patent leather, so shiny black, right? It's like rectangle, and it goes down kind of in the middle, so there's like a circle kind of on the top, and the handle comes up, and it circles, and you can pop it up and down, up and down, like those bracelets you slap on your wrist, but this is from like the 50s. Oh my God, and I loved, I would like sit in church and start playing, and she thumped me. Anybody have a thumping mom? Thump you, just like reach over. But what's really amazing is I can open that, and it smells like, it takes me all of a sudden back to being a little girl sitting in church trying to be still and quiet. And I can open it and it smells like Kleenex and lipstick and Wrigley Spearmint gum. And that is the smell of my mom. Right? I mean, she wore perfume and all that, but and, and I'll smell that perfume. It takes me back to that too. But that in that purse... It's still, and I opened it up about a year ago after like doing this lecture, and I, I went home one day, and I was like, getting something in my closet, and I'm like, oh, and I grabbed it and, you know, shined it off and everything and opened it, and I don't know if it was just in my mind or if I really could smell it, but I still smelled that smell, and, and that was pervasive, and all of a sudden, I am that little kid, and, you know, sitting by my mom, playing, getting in trouble for making noise in church. Yeah, right. Anybody else would see that purse, and people who like purses, might say, wow, that's really cool. You know, it might be like classic or so, I don't know. It might be worth something now. God, it's 50s, so it's like almost 70 years old. Wow, could be. I wouldn't sell it for anything. Well, unless I actually had to feed my family. But it would take a lot to get me to sell it. Because it is so, even to get rid of it, I don't use it. Not a purse-carrying kind of gal. It means so much more. 
it's all those memories of my childhood. It's that sense of my mom. The pot that I make chili in, chili beans, you know, like Texas chili. My mom, it's this old cast iron skillet, and it just, it, you know, it is what it is. That is also family and childhood and all those moments. Right? Um, those things, that's what we're looking for. Now, you may be one of those people who's like, sorry, Kelly, I'm not really a sentimental person. I don't keep a whole lot of stuff. Eh, don't have anything passed down to me. Eh, my my t-shirts get all janky. I get rid of them. Keep them. That's okay, too. Right? Because it doesn't have to be something that is that necessarily emotional. We'll read a lot of these, and what we've read so far, they are those things. Um, but it also can be something that just holds meaning in your life, that provides something really important. When I see my laptop, one, I just bought it last year, decided to actually drop some money, All right, not, not go out the cheap way. So I'm kind of proud, proud I'm a cheapskate, so I'm pretty proud that I actually did that, right? Um, and it, I mean, it has a lot of kind of things for that. So there's that kind of, okay, you know, you decided to kind of actually spend some money on yourself, Kelly, and you did this to help you for just work generally in life. But I also, I mean, it does. It, it, I think of work. So yeah, on one hand, I can think stressful, but I also think of students I've had before, of doing this and being here and how good it is to be alive today, right now with y'all, with y'all, each and every one of you, right? That's, that's what it brings to me. Uh, I'm going to be waxing a little emotional today, whatever. Uh, I know, it was. It was totally that song. <laughs> so, so, but it could be something more practical. Right? It could be something you have. It could be something that is somebody else's or was somebody else's. You don't still have to have it. But think about that. You've got to decide on something. So that's where you make your decision. I had somebody write once about this pencil he still had from like you know freshman sophomore year that this girl he had a crush on had dropped and they actually ended up dating later on but he never mentioned it to her like you know he wanted to give it back to her because it was like he felt guilty about having her pencil because he's like you know it, it, he, she dropped it i need to give it. but like at first he was too nervous about it and then once they started dating and everything she was she was good with pencils okay but he just you know it got put in that drawer or whatever and it was just like you know this is this is that thing it's a pencil it didn't really mean anything but it represents that time in my life. I have an old John Cougar, not John Cougar Mellencamp, not John Mellencamp. We can go through all of his ch name changes. In 1983, came out with his album, American Fool. It was the first cassette tape I ever bought. Oh yeah, I had eight tracks too because I inherited my sister's car. I didn't buy those though, I'm not that old. I don't have that cassette tape anymore, but I still have the case for it. It's like having the CD cover, but you don't have the CD and you keep it because it's not, you know, like I can't put any one thing on that, but that was the summer I turned 13. It was huge. I ended up spending a lot of time with my cousins. I don't see much. I mean, it was just, it was, it was that summer. And every time I see that, like it's on the top of one of my shelves, just stacked with some other cassettes that I really need to get rid of because I don't listen to cassettes. I don't even know if I have a cassette player anymore that works. Um, but I walk by and I see that and all of a sudden it's that summer I was 13. So it could be something that brings back a time or something like that for you. Now, when you decide, it doesn't really matter. I love my, star, my ceramic car, Starbucks cup that I keep in my car. Oh, right. It doesn't really matter. You've got to have something to say, so you want to have some connection to it, whether it's emotional, sentimental, family, or intellectual. But it's just English class. And this is just practice. This is where we do the practice so you can try out things, you can get things right, you can make mistakes, learn how to correct them. So when you go out and you write for all these people out here, outside of this room, or maybe later on in this room, you write for a boss, you write for somebody else, you have that practice. So this is just practice, this is scrimmage. So don't obsess too much if you're just, you know, really caught up. Just say, look, what would I pick? And if you have two or three things, write them down on a piece of paper, like literally do this. Write them down, crumple them up, mix them up, and then pick one and say, okay, this is the one I have to do. Have to. Have to. 
You can even email me and tell me, I'm going to do the first one I pick. And then when you open it up, you'll either be like, cool, or you'll be like, oh. And if you go, oh, don't do that one, because that's your gut telling you, I don't want to do this one. Okay. So in terms of choices, it's practice for English class. Right? I've had a number of students write really good essays and tell me later, I made that all up. And I was like, cool, you made it up good. Right? You've got to make it up honest and true. It's got to be real. All right. Are you still practicing writing? Hell yeah. Okay. So there you go. Um, so how do we do this? Well, we got to get at first is one, choosing your topic. So there's my advice on choosing your topic. Remember, it's just English class. You may already have some ideas. Use that old t-shirt, that pot that, you know, somebody always cooked the beans in. My ex-husband, man, I can still see the pot he always cooked the beans in. And it was silver, so it was a, a stainless, but it had like some dents on the bottom of it where it had been banged around and things like that. I think one of the handles was like half broken. Whatever you want, right? Um, but what we want to get to next is say, okay, how do I describe this so it's not just, yeah, that old pot? Because even bent with like some half broke handle, that's more specific, but that's not quite there. So when we do description, here are keys to what we want to remember to do. You want to describe the unique qualities. And I always use the example of a classroom. I know we're sitting in one, but when somebody says the word classroom, if you weren't sitting here, what would you think of? What do we have to have to make something a classroom? Desk, right? Some space for students. Some space for teachers. We usually got a whiteboard, a blackboard, something like that. What else? Pencil sharpener. We got it. Cool. Walls. Doors, maybe. So if we're lucky, some windows. We're not like in a cave, right? We're lucky the teacher opens them instead of shutting out the world. You must look at only me. So those are kind of common. If a classroom didn't have doors or walls, that'd be unique, right? What we can do is we can trust people. And if you have something that's pretty common, you know, that people know about in the world, then you can say it's this thing. And they bring a whole lot of packaging. So they're going to bring that kind of general stuff. Um, but what you want to do is let them do some of the work. We don't have to do all the work. So we say classroom, boom, all of a sudden we have these kind of common things. And then what we want to do is really focus on those unique qualities because then that makes it not just classroom, but this classroom. Right? The clock at the back, the students scattered here and there versus a classroom where every desk is full. That's unique, too, right, how it is. The, oh, wait, these aren't that color, are they? These are off-white. In, in that room over there in 1810, they have blinds, and they're um, funky 70s yellow. Can you imagine that? Like a funky 70s yellow blinds? And half of them are, you know, got, got bent blinds on them, things like that for a while. They were really bad, right? Some of the classrooms have a blue wall at the back, right? You might go further in, in describing and saying a weird English teacher in the front. All right. So what you want to do is you want to think about those unique things. Courtney and Josue both told us they had this ring. Fenn told us she had, she had this bike. But what did they really point out? What are those things that make it unique? Um, use concrete words. So it's not just the white blinds, but the off-white ones. Not just the yellow ones, but the funky 70s yellow. Um, use sensory details. All of those things so far are very much what we see. But what about what we feel? When Fenn says, you know, when you touch that, that tube there, it feels like, you know, the skin of a, a black, bumpy avocado. Wow, we can feel that. Is it smooth? Is it soft? Is it worn? Is it rugged? Whatever. Think about what it feels. What is it? About what it looks like. What does it feel like? Does it have a smell? Now, you're not going to smell everything. I'm going to give you a list. I'm going to show you what English teachers smell. Yeah. Um, you can't lick everything. You don't need to lick it. Um, sometimes, so, I mean, try to get as many of these in here as you can. Sometimes we are tempted to say, I just can't describe it. You may not say that in this essay. That's your job. Okay. But sometimes we do. We look at it and we're like, okay, there's something else here, but I just don't have the words. Well, then what we do is we do that comparison. 
not only did Finn give us that kind of texture, that bumpy avocado skin, she compared it to something, that's actually the tube of the bike, and she compared it to something that we could understand. So using those kinds of figures of speech, when we say he's as tall as a tree, we don't mean he's actually as tall as that tree because, dang, that's tall. Right? We mean really tall, exceptionally tall. Try to avoid too many cliche ones that have been used over and over because it's like, well, they've been used over and over. But think about, can I say this is like something or some part of it is like this? Because a lot of times when we have that moment, and I've had that moment too, where it's like, okay, I, I want to kind of, I'm looking at something or I'm thinking about it and I want to describe it and I really can't find the words. Then you ask yourself, what is it like? Do that comparison to something that you can explain, and that helps. Um, and then we're looking for the dominant impression, the emotional description. That doesn't mean emotional, like, uh, but just kind of the overall feeling, the tone, the vibe it has. What is it overall when you look at that, right? It may be kind of parts of the memories, whatever it is, that feeling, that sense. Being 13, first of all, I was a teenager. Wow. Don't remember when you turned 13? Were you like, dude, I'm 13? Yeah. I'm not 12, I'm 13, right? Sense of freedom, sense of, yeah, I'm, I'm getting toward grown up, that kind of stuff. Um, a little sense of carelessness, totally on my part. Like, ah, not quite, like I wasn't an asshole like Cartman, but I definitely had some of that I do what I want attitude. Um, that's part of that dominant impression, that overall feeling. And that's something we're describing too. Um, my computer. A sense of security that, you know, the other one was old, old, and really just, I mean, dude, that it's this new computer that, you know, this sense that it's going to work, that those kinds of things. That's, that's really good, too, that I didn't have to reply on the college's computers where they won't doubt, let us download tools we need to do what our job. That sense of security, right, of more independence in that way. So those are really kind of key things in thinking about this. And if you just kind of go through that list and say, what can I say about my object in terms of, you know, each one of these things, that'll get you there. Um, let me give you an example. So if I write this sentence, my copy of the book, Elmer Gantry, and I put it in italics because it's the name of a book, big thing, so I'm telling you. It's a title. It's very important to me. It's blue and orange. It is blue and orange, very old, and was given to me by my friend Amy. That's all you need to know, right? Doesn't quite even get half as close as any of these we've read. It doesn't give you that description, that feeling. So what your first step is, and what my first step was, and this is the assignment, it's this easy. Write a list. You bring that in on Tuesday, I stamp it, it's a 100. You gotta turn it in when you turn in your essay, so I write it down in the grade book, okay? You make a list. Make a list of every kind of detail and description you can. And if you don't still have that thing, you take it in your mind's eye, really, literally, if this works. Close your eyes and imagine it with the person who owns it, has it, had it, with yourself, if you're holding it in your hands, you're in some moment, close your eyes and just see it. Will your memory be 100% accurate? No. Does it really matter? No. Actually, our memories are not ever 100% accurate. So if it mattered, then we're all screwed all the time. Okay. But see it, feel it, imagine it. If you have that thing, we're going to read about some old, nasty, hand-me-down shoes of all things that I know are probably still in Miranda's closet somewhere. Get that thing out. Look at it. Smell it. I hope Miranda did not lick her shoes. Okay? Don't have to lick it. So. All right. So here's my list. My book. It's blue and orange. Oh, wait. It has a woven cloth covering. It smells like dust and mold. The binding on the left is bright orange. There are small wisps of thread. The small wisps of thread are coming off the binding. Published in 1929. Front and back covers are slate blue. Behind the frayed cloth binding on the outer corners, you can see the cardboard. Between the R and the Y of Gantry, the remnant of a price tag or sticker. It's inscribed to Kelly from Boston's Brattle bookstore, Amy. The pages are faded to manila and darker around the edges. 
The paper has a very coarse texture. It's thick. The novels of Grace Livingston Hill are advertised on the back of the book. Inside the back, between the cover and the spine, you can see the netting. So I took that book in my head. Oh, hand, and look what I did. I smelled it. Yeah, people who love books are weird. We like sniff books. I don't know. Anyway, it smells like dust and mold. I took that book in my hands, and I just really looked at it, right? I didn't just look at it. I examined it. And I said, what is it that makes this not just any other copy of Elmer Gantry, any other blue and orange book? It's this one. And so that's what I did. So I've got physical descriptions there, right? I didn't lick it, okay? I didn't, didn't really make a sound. It's, it's a book. You know, um, but I tried as much to get all of those other kinds of things like the texture and the feel, all of that I could. But there's more because this book, I picked this book for some reason because it represents something more. So there are kind of two ways to look at it. One is to get this dominant impression is what does just the book feel like overall? And what I would add to my list there is old, well-loved, fun, permanent. I mean, you can tell if people have read this book. So it's not just one that got bought and got, you know, kicked off in a corner. Um, and then also, I can't look at that book without thinking about my friend Amy. So I'm going to kind of think of some kind of basic things in terms of overall what it kind of tells me or reminds me of with her. Um, adventurous, travel, Boston. She decided one year, she had some friends who lived in Boston, and she was like, you know what, I'm going to go live for uh, Boston in a year. For Bos in Boston for a year. Words, they're so hard. She did. Dude, I don't know if I'm, well, I picked up and moved to Vegas with a two-month-old baby. So, yeah, I had done that too. But that idea of just adventure, right, of saying, you know what, I want to do this thing, and doing it, despite the fear, jumping off, seeing if you can fly. Um, she loves old books. She's an English major too, English teacher too. Um, knows me. I love the movie Elmer Gantry. Made her watch it with me, so she knew I'd love to read the book. So, you know, that takes me back to, like, you know, when she came over, like, on Friday nights, you know, at the end of the school week, we'd, I'd cook dinner, and she'd come over, and we'd watch a movie or whatever, this or that. And so it takes me back to that. That's my list. So I'd have these things physically that describe it, and to it, I'm going to add these things that kind of give the overall about the book to me, but also, since this is related to Amy, to me, if I was writing about that cassette case, I would talk about my 13-ness, right? What was that feeling that summer? I'd have to mention my cousins. And that's it. That's your job. Write a list. You do that, huh? Cool beans? Yeah. So remember, those are the key tips for description. Think about the unique stuff. Think about not just how things look, but sound, feel, touch, taste, smell. You know, if you're writing about that pot that somebody cooks something in, man, in a minute, man, my ex-husband may be an ex-husband, but dude, he could cook one of the best pots of beans I've ever had, and my sister makes seriously good beans. I do too. I walk in her house, in his house, when he's, you know, he put beans on in the morning, I come home at the end of the day at work. Oh. Smell great, and I have to do a whole lot like, right? It smelled like I smell like home. I don't know. There's something having grown up on the border when a pot of beans is cooking. There's something homey about that. It's just good. So think about all of those things. Um, write down words, phrases, sentences. Mine came out in mostly, you know, um, phrases, that kind of thing. You got sentences here. I've got a sentence. You got sentences coming out in your list? Cool. Let it be that thing. It doesn't have to be just necessarily boom, boom, boom. If yours comes out, boom, boom, boom in a list, that's cool too. Okay? So if you have ideas going, don't feel the need to stop yourself. The more you get down in these, the more stuff you got to work with later. So um, all your senses, sight, touch, smell, taste, sound, size, color, shape, texture. Think about its weight and feel, its emotional tone or vibe. Every detail you can think of. Just make a big-ass list. Um, your job is to get all those down. Use that example. You want to go back and look at mine? You can. There it is. Remember, it's on the essay one page, and you can click on free writing one.